Hey guys, David Fleming here of AMN Academy. Now, I've just had the privilege of recording an interview with Dr. John D. Martini, human behavioral specialist, founder of the D. Martini Institute, educator and business consultant. Now, I can honestly say that this is one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had. So please sit back and enjoy this interview. Okay, AMA community, thank you for tuning in to this interview today. It's an absolute pleasure and a real privilege to speak with Dr. John D. Martini of the D. Martini Institute. And uh, welcome, first of all, Dr. John. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and having me. Thank you very much. So, first of all, I think we have a mutual student to thank for um, putting us in touch, the wonderful Mary Hitchcock. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, yes, I definitely, uh, I know Mary very well. Yeah, excellent. Well, she's a, she's a lovely lady. She's doing great things. I just wanted to thank her for putting us in touch in the first place. So, um, Dr. Martini, first of all, could you just give us your stance on really what mind-body medicine actually is? <laughs> well, I've been involved in that for 45 years. And I, even though I have heard various views on the topic, I have difficulty comprehending how anyone could even consider that they're not related and they're separated in function. You cannot have a perception without a change in physiology, both brain-wise and physiology-wise. I've been studying the relationships. I just presented a program for five days on 1,000 health conditions and the underlying psychology underlying them just, just a few days ago. So that has been um, a very important topic for me for all these years. So I don't know why anybody would even question the thought that those are separate entities. Mm -hmm. The mind body is, uh, or the brain body, because some people, some empiricists do not believe that there is a mind. They believe that the mind is purely brain function. And so they're looking at the brain uh, access to physiology, and that's okay. But I believe that there's imminent and transcendent capacities of the mind uh, within the brain function that allows us to uh, show the correlations between our perceptions, our physiology. And I've yet to see a condition that doesn't have psychological factors. Well, that, that's a, a beautiful way to put it. And you, you've mentioned a few um, fascinating things there, which I um, completely concur and agree with. Um, could you expand at all on some of the actual mechanisms that you've probably just presented on very recently on, on how this mind and physiology interaction actually occurs? Well, each individual, based on their experiences, even during gestation and from birth on, um, accumulate perceptions through the senses senses that we know, the five basic senses, and the many other senses that we mostly don't think about, from cell receptors, etc. We accumulate experiences that are perceived as either pleasureful or painful in the brain, and that we seek or avoid. They're either seen as prey or predator, biologically. And as we accumulate them, if they're not integrated, they're stored in our what we have called the subconscious mind. And they cause us to filter our reality accordingly and cause us to react with seek or avoiding mechanism, prey or predator mechanisms. And we see them at a higher level as things we like and dislike or infatuate and resent or things that we, we think are survival oriented or could inter interfere with our life. And those initiate certain ratios of transmitters in a brain and neuroendocrine neuromodulation system and endocrine system and alter cell receptor stereochemistry wise which then causes a cascading of enzymes either at the cell wall or inside the cell in the nucleus in some cases and cause epigenetic effects inside the nucleus and uh, cytoplasmic alterations inside the cell that are labeled literally um, disease. Because what we do is our, our epigenetic component 
uh, can actually duplicate and delete genetic components <clears throat> through transpositions and, and alterations in their genetic expression. And they're regulatory in effect. So we can literally, with our perceptions, change our cells and their expression and what they release, the proteins that they release and packaged proteins and sugars, et cetera, that they release, change receptor sites, change functions in the cell. And each of these, if they're excessive or deficient in function, have a title, which we call an illness. Illness is nothing more than a feedback mechanism to our consciousness to let us know where we have imbalanced subconsciously stored perceptions, either by initiations, promotions, or compounding of these initial perceptions that are shockings to the system. They're feedback mechanism to guide us to ask new questions intuitively to reestablish a balance in homeostasis or allostasis in the brain by changing our perceptions. Our perceptions, um, our decisions and our actions are what we have control over. And anytime we have an alteration in perceptions, we have an alteration in decisions, we have an alteration in actions at both the gross level and at the subtle cellular level. And our filaments and our fibers and our uh, cytoplasmic components inside the cell are literally being modified and changed in billions of a second to adjust to our perceptions. And we label those illness. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Most people have probably had an experience where they have had a shocking um, reaction and anger about something. And then notice that they had a sore throat or a fever sometimes within hours. And sometimes the common cold or even the flu, which are supposedly labeled viral, because viruses used to be in the earlier germ theory to be something we have defended against and attacked. And now we're in our ecological microbiome orientation, we're now looking at it as wildlife ecological management instead of attacking and protecting us. We're trying to keep the viruses and the bacteria and the rickettsia and the, and the mycobiota in balance instead of trying to defend against it. But we, we can actually initiate inside our genome viral component in reverse genetic expressions, viruses and bacteria. We can generate these things inside us, not be infected by them and create through parasympathetic or sympathetic imbalances the autonomic responses that create what we have labeled the cold and flu. So I'm not convinced that it's just an incubation of some virus. I think that's a very small view because a thousand people could be exposed to the same virus and, and only 10 people may uh, succumb to it. And those 10 people may have stresses and emotional reactions that make them vulnerable. And those have been deleted. We're so used to a separation of cause and effect in the illness model in medicine that we think that something on the outside causes us and something on the outside us heals us. But the real power inside us is what we have control over, our perceptions, decisions, and actions. So a lot of illnesses are epigenetic responses to perceptions affecting cells and, and in both the nucleus and, and the cytoplasm and causing the expression of proteins uh, to cause changes in physiology, structural or enzymatic, that we call illness. And almost every one of those illnesses we can trace back and we can bite down into that. Even genetic illnesses. I, I have people that have supposedly had um, genetic enzyme deficiencies, for instance, mm -hmm. and they're having difficulty, difficulty with gluten or they're different with an enzyme, that I've been able to change in psychology these things and now they're able to tolerate gluten and they're supposedly not supposed to be able to genetically. But somehow there's been a change in epigenetic influences by changing perceptions that's making it available to do it. I've had hundreds of people that have had allergies. They want to blame pollen and blame things on the outside. And we've changed perceptions and stacked associations made on the environment where these pollens are that they made in their brain. So pollen may be in the atmosphere. They may have experienced something that was traumatic or painful. It got associated in the brain with the pollen, and now the pollen is being attacked as an autonomic response and a histamine response for mast cells um, that have nothing to do with pollens being a, a problem here. Because I've taken hundreds of people through uh, so-called allergies and reassociated new perceptions with these so-called allergens 
and they don't have any allergies anymore. Gone. So I, I've seen this many times. I've seen people with diabetes that are supposedly, I've got a lot of cases of diabetes. They're no longer taking insulin. We're talking about for months or years now, no, no longer taking insulin because we've gone in and identified the self-righteous pride response from feeling like they've projected their values onto people and they're not meeting their needs and they're being angry and they're uh, inducing these changes in neurohormones, these or glandular hormones in this case, um, that are labeled diabetes. So I'm, I'm convinced that there's way more to the mind-body connection than, than most people ever give credit to. And I've been focusing on this for a long time. Absolutely. Well, there, there's a, a huge number of things that I'd love to um, jump into and try and have you expand on a little bit. But I know we, we have a certain amount of time. So allow me to just pick up on one thing you mentioned there. Um, you mentioned there's the, the five senses, the kind of, let's say, the more extra receptive mechanoreceptive senses maybe that we have and also those of the the interaction with our environment from the external uh, but you've also mentioned more really what is the interoceptive environment and those things which we maybe we don't consider senses maybe electromagnetic and electrical field interactions etc would you say that the the internal milieu of the body and all of that interaction that goes on is that really a source of the subconscious well let me define, I'm going to give you my definition of the subconscious. Uh, every individual lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life. You have certain things that are important to you, maybe studying healthcare, doing radio podcasts, things of this nature. But you may have something like myself that is very low in value, like cooking or driving. I haven't driven in 27 years. I don't cook since I was 24. So we have a hierarchy of values. Whenever we're living in alignment and congruent with our highest values, the blood glucose and oxygen goes up into the more forebrain area, the executive center, where we have more objective reason and where our feelings are not emotional, but are actually gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, certainty, and presence, which I call the six cardinals of a more masterful life. There we have more poise there we have more resilience, adaptability, because we're not in, uh, we're, we're, we're able to see both sides of events. We don't see things good or bad. We don't see things right or wrong. We don't sit there in a primitive moral construct. We see things from a hidden order and we see things as there's always two sides to things. We have an objectivity. Objectivity means even mindedness. But if we are subordinating to people on the outside and envying them and thinking they have something we don't, and injecting their values into our life and attempting to live outside our own highest value where we have more fulfillment and we live in lower values. The unfulfillment that emerges from that makes us seek immediate gratification and gets us into our amygdala where we want to avoid pain and seek pleasure and where we want to avoid predator and seek prey. And we get into a desire for consumerism and addictive behaviors and addictive behavior is a compensation for unfulfilled highest values. In this state, we have we now know that we don't have objectivity, we have subjective biases, a confirmation biases for the things that we like, a disconfirmation bias for things we don't, or vice versa. These distortions in our perception make us vulnerable because now we have the fear of loss of that which we infatuate with and we have the fear of gain of that which we resent. We fear the loss of prey, we fear the loss of predator. We're more vulnerable, we have lost our resilience and we polarize our perceptions and polarize our physiology accounting and our hormones and transmitters change. If a, if a tiger opens, if a door is open and a tiger jumps into a room and you did a blood chemistry on somebody, you would see dopamine, oxytocin, vasopressin, serotonin, kephalons, endorphins, estrogen drop and cortisol and histamine and testosterone and the substance P would go up and norepinephrine, epinephrine, they all go up. So you'd immediately, in billionth of a second, change that chemistry. If you uh, reverse that and find out it was Tony Tiger who came in the, the room and came up and gave you a big hug and, and is a, uh, you're always wanted to meet Tony Tiger, all those chemistries reverse. Our pharmaceutical industry wants us to believe that our, our chemical imbalances is what's causing all our problems. And they want to sell a drug. That's bullshit. That's not where the problem is. It's our stacked associations because every time we have an imbalanced perspective with subjective biases, 
Anyone that has not been integrated with memory and anti-memories in the brain and integrated and balanced stays as electrical activity and noise in the brain, which we call the subconscious mind, reverberating around in the brain, causing entropy and in many cellular necrotic states and, and apoptosis gets accelerated. We destroy our brain, particularly the most advanced part of our brain. And that subconsciousness is the storage of all the imbalanced perspectives and that's ultimately where our illnesses are coming from. Our illnesses are feedback mechanisms to let we know, let us know that we've stored lies about the magnificence of the universe. We haven't seen the poised balance objectively, and we're storing our subjective biases, and we're living in this anxiety of avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. The Buddha said the desire for that which is unavailable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human suffering. And we live in that world in the when we're living by our lower values and we're comparing ourselves to others that way. We're not here to compare ourselves to others. We're not here to live in the shadows of anyone. We're here to stand on the shoulders of giants and live congruently with what we value most as an authentic individual wanting to make a unique difference in the world. And that is where we have the, you might say, the alpha positioning where we have resilience and adaptability and we have strength because we have objective reason. We're in touch with things. We're not living in elusive perspectives. And our decisions are clear, concise, and our actions are executed according to what is highest on our value. That's wellness factor. That creates you stress, not distress. That's awesome. Uh, that's all I can, the only way I can sum that up so far. That's, that's amazing. Um, I want to just uh, get your opinion on something else as well, if I may. Um, you're describing the huge influential role of one's perceptions. Um, you're describing when you live uh, in line with your highest order values, that there is an objectivity which is derived from that. Um, I sometimes, I don't like to call it a separation per se, but it's almost an ability to see kind of what the machine, what the physiology does and where our whole place in this whole experience lies. Um, which is a beautiful concept and one that I absolutely um, completely ascribe to also. Where do you see, I know this is an interesting topic for me because there are, there are those who um, perceive consciousness as something which is derived from complexity and generated from the activity of the brain. And then there's the other camp, those who think that consciousness ultimately is fundamental and that um, maybe it's that, it's that which provides us the ability to see and experience that objectivity to a degree. So do you, do you yourself describe um, some kind of distinction between mind and consciousness? And do you give consciousness a primacy in this overall effect of healing and change and that, what, what it is that you're describing? Well, as far as we can trace back uh, pre-Socratic Greeks all the way till today, I don't know of any era that did not have panpsychism as a philosophy. Panpsychism is a idea that there's a fundamental intelligence in the universe, a consciousness, that space and time and matter are conditional states of consciousness and radiant energy is an unconditional state of consciousness. Today in physics, physics uh, we have what is called boson statistics, Einstein boson statistics and fermion Dirac statistics. One is for bosons, which are, you could have an infinite number of bosons occupying one over infinity space, because a photon, for instance, which is an example of a boson, has no space, no time, no mass, no charge. Then you have fermions, which are particles like electrons, positrons. They make up ordinary matter that occupies space and time and has uncertainty principles to it. If we were to correlate the matter in space-time of leptons and, and uh, the fermions, they would be like conditional states of mind. And there are, some people believe that, that entropy is nothing more than scattered minds that are emotionally charged. There's physicists that actually comprehend that. And that, that a state of grace where people have no desire to change themselves relative to others or others relative to themselves, there's just a poised state, an enlightened state, a bodhisattva state, if you will, is radiant. That's why they've always throughout the ages considered that. So panpsychism, I think, underlies this. Erwin Schrodinger was a panpsychic. Max Planck was a panpsychic. Freeman Dyson, still to this day, is a, yeah, I've, I've spent time with him. He's a panpsychic. Uh, Aristotle was a panpsychic. He believed in entelechy in the universe. 
uh, David Chalmers. There's many people throughout the ages that um, were considered that way. Even Schopenhauer, a philosopher, believed that that was underlying things. So I believe that that's underlying that. And that there's special cases. Even Freeman Dyson said he believed that there were decisions being made at the subatomic particle level, at the human level, and at the universal level. He even wrote in Scientific American, August edition, 1993, if I'm not mistaken. He said that uh, if the universe was having a big bang, which is a, a questionable theory, I, I, in my cosmology, I question that, even though many people are stuck in that with institutional imperatives. Um, if the universe was expanding, they asked him, what would happen to intelligence, consciousness? And he said that it would probably be conserved through charged particles of light, which are fermions. Now, I had a debate with him about that, a discussion with him about it many years ago. And I believe that consciousness is the fundamental component and that the, the part that's conditional or unconditional is what's manifesting or not manifesting. It means it's in form of matter or it's in form of energy. So we... Our perception, that's why collapsing the wave function in, in quantum theory is it, it, we and our mind can affect those behaviors. I think there's a, an inseparability between that. Now, whether we want to limit it to mind based on a boundary condition that we artificially say that, you know, our thinking uh, as a brain, as a human mind is consciousness. But if you've ever studied the mysteries of the living cell, I wrote two big volumes called Mysteries of the Living Cell. Uh, it's about a thousand page, two volume set on just cell physiology. Uh, I know that teleology has been trying to rape, been raped from all of, of uh, the modern science because they don't want to have to acknowledge that there might be a final cause, like Aristotle said, or uh, as syntropy constructs that Luigi Fantapi described. But if we look carefully, it may be that negentropy, life physics, uh, is a state of consciousness and death physics, entropy is a state of consciousness, and that that's really underlying it all. And I think that uh, the mysteries of living self, you go inside the cell, there's no way you can go and probe the mysteries of a cell. If you take a kinesin molecule and it's transporting a vacuole along one of the, uh, the, one of the little fibers going from the nucleus out to the cell wall, if you study that and watch that, there's no way you can watch that and think that that's a random event, a thermodynamic event with just pure probability. There's no way. If you look at how the things are working in the cell on an intricate level, I mean, if you look at, there's a thing called alo valency now on cell uh, stereochemistry that is basically looking at entanglement sitting inside cell receptor systems to make sure that target molecules uh, on the cell receptor is found by a neurohormone or a transmitter and how these things are found, not randomly in the cell, they go right to the cell receptor. And that's not by some gradient, electrochemical gradient. There's there's intelligence there, <clears throat> and it knows it. But we don't want to call it that because we're afraid of that term because then it gives rise to a constraint that anthropomorphic religions gave rise to. See, most people don't realize, it was Einstein who said, it is enough for me on a daily basis to sit in awe and contemplate the intelligence that permeates the universe. That, that's what he wanted to know. He just wanted to know how the divine master plan worked, you might say, like Newton did. But what's happened is man has been feared, frightened, geomorphically, zoomorphically, and anthropomorphically by, by the elements around him, by nature, and created a dissociative identity complex as a freeze response and created an artificial god that is given rise to a, a negative connotation to religion. And so religion has used these teleological constructs over the ages and said there's a design and there's a purpose and there's intelligence. And science just knows that anthropomorphic religions are, are man-made. And so they attacked it and got rid of, they tried to get rid of teleology. But no matter how hard they try, they can't do it. All they do is reduce it down to smaller components down into the cell components. So no matter how far we go into the subatomic world, we're still going to come up with a teleological uh, construct. Terence Deacon in his Incomplete Nature addressed this in the first few chapters of his text, which I think he did a great job on. And I think that... Um, the more we study the mysteries of the cell, the more we are humbled. I, I, I still question it with Dyson. I said with him one time in his office there, because he took over Albert Einstein's office in 1955. He's, I said, you know, if you took all the Nobel Prize winners, all the greatest biologists, all the quantum biologists in the world, all the quantum cognition specialists, and you put them all together in a, in a conference, 5,000 of them around the world, the greatest minds, they still couldn't run a single cell. 
not even a prokaryotic cell. And yet 3.9 to 4.1 billion years ago, they were already on the planet. And that may have been panspermically origin and or may, may have geo, geo origin. But the point is that that's, that was already on the planet then. So if we are the most advanced consciousness on the planet with our complex neurology and we can't figure out how to run a single cell, we got to ask how that cell come about. Is it from another planetary system? Is it from this planetary here? Is there more, is there more intelligence that we're going to discover? I don't know these questions. I've, I've paused and, and on those contemplations, but I think that uh, we'd be wise to humble ourselves to an intelligence in the universe. I've, I, I teach a program called the Breakthrough Experience. I've done it 1,117 times around the world, 63 countries. And I take people through a process I call the Demartini Method to help them have a glimpse where they can't sit there and, and comprehend it without acknowledging there may just be an intelligence in the universe. I show them pairs of opposites and a hidden order in the events that go on in their life and why that these events are going on where they just sit there in awe. Many are brought to tears. And when they see that, there's healings that go on because when they experience that hidden order and are not stuck in their projections of their own valuations of the universe, uh, and they're really humbled to a higher level of order to it, they heal. I still think that I, that true gratitude and true love is still the greatest healers on the planet. I remember watching Denton Cooley, who was a great, uh, one of the greatest cardiovascular surgeons ever lived. I watched him in the domes and watched him in his healing, and I delivered his surgery schedules many years ago, 30-something years ago, 39 years, 40 years ago. And um, I was amazed. He understood this. And even though he's a great cardiovascular you know, allopathic medicine specialist, he understood that component and he respected that component. The real, real true scientists are not anti-true religion. They're anti-anthropomorphic false constructs that have been imposed by institutional religious constructs. And I, I'm a firm believer that there is a, a magnificent intelligence in the universe that our further probing will only uncover. Well, absolutely. And I think as science and scientists in general, uh, maybe not in general, but where pockets of, of some of the top thinkers in the world evolved towards um, a kind of a coupling of, let's say, spirituality as a term um, and science. It's just great to know that as that progresses, that for the last 45 years, people like you have been working on these concepts and making it something that's practically applicable to help people in their lives. So I think that's um, that's a great thing that you've done and a great thing for people to be aware of. So I hugely, hugely appreciate the time you've given us today. If people did want to look more into um, the sort of trainings that you offer, what could they do? How could they get in touch with you? Well, they can just go to my website, drdmartini.com, and they can, they can spend them probably from now into eternity just watching videos, audios, reading materials. There's There's thousands of articles and audio clips and video clips and and I do seminars all over the world I do I, I speak somewhere between 300 to 400 times a year and I do about a thousand interviews a year so I, there's plenty of stuff on there if they want to if they want to delve into it but um, I, I'm one thing I, I really believe you know it was, it was uh, when I was 18 years old I read a book called the discourse of metaphysics by, by Leibniz Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz he was the one that co-founded the calculus with Newton at two different locations. And um, he said that there was a, a hidden order. He called it, now he was a theological and mathematical guy, and so he basically called it the divine perfection, a divine beauty, a divine love, a divine order in the universe that few people ever get to know, but those that do, their lives are changed forever. Well, David Bohm called it the implicate order. Mm -hmm. uh, Aristotle called it entelechy. Dyson called it consciousness. I don't care what they call it. Uh, Luigi Fontapi called it syntropy. I don't care what they call it. Uh, the more you probe into the mysteries of existence, the essence behind existence, I think the more humble you become to this, this wisdom that's sitting there. And I think anybody, and I, I make this comment, that no great Nobel Prize winner, no great uh, philosopher, natural philosopher, no great uh, theologian, no great thinker in through history, Whatever persisted hours and hours and days and days and weeks and months and years and decades in the pursuit of solving a single problem, if they didn't innately have an intuitive sense that there was a hidden order in the universe or science could not even exist, 
Science could not exist if there was pure randomness in the universe. There has to be, even in chaos theory, random and order, they have to come in pairs. There's a law of heuristic escalation showing that even in sociology. You could not have pursued that and got the Nobel Prizes without a belief that there's some sort of rational order that mathematically will show itself in some elegance of symmetry. Absolutely. I mean, there's researchers currently today who are, are, are putting out um, theories that, of course, consciousness is absolutely fundamental and that ultimately we need to rethink evolution, the Big Bang, everything within that context. Um, I have been doing that for 45 years. <laughs> absolutely. I have, a, absolutely. I have versions of the evolutionary process and the so-called Big Bang. Absolutely. Well, I am looking forward to digging into more of your material. As I say, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. I really do appreciate your time. And um, maybe at some point we can do it again. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Martini.